be a limit to the amount of party music. There be two red bones kissing in the back seat. So you I one of the red bones. <laughs> noodles out the pot. We will share like one big pot or like hamburger helper. Five people eating out one pot. Couldn't afford no forks. Couldn't afford no plates. Hello everyone, I'm here with Luminosity Journal 2.0 and I have my friend Sharis in the team, Ms. Sharis. And she is from the illustrious, as she loves to say, the illustrious North Carolina A&T and she is an Aggie. So we're going to talk about just your college experience and just your life in general. So tell me, like, what made you uh, love North Carolina A&T? So what really made me love it is that I have went to multiple schools. So I went to Robert Precious Pearl and they took us on college tours every spring break. So this year, I was my, I was a junior, so this was my junior year. So this was my third college tour I had a bit on. So we went to a t Howard, and Fayetteville State. Now, we came back and saw a t on the way back. Mm -hmm. So it was like we went, when we first went to North Carolina, we stopped at Fayetteville State, and we went to Howard, and on our way back, we stopped at a t mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, uh, well, I didn't have a good vibe, I guess, mm -hmm. from Howard and, and Fayetteville State. At Howard, it was not what I thought it was going to be like. Everybody talks about Howard. It's so... Okay, if y'all don't know, Howard is my favorite school. And she just said she didn't like Howard. It's, it's not what you think it is. In my opinion. <laughs> like, when I got there, I was like, y'all don't have central air conditioning in your residence halls. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Like, things like that. I was like, y'all have two residence halls. Mm -hmm. And then there are male only female only like i just couldn't wrap my head around that like it was just not what i expected i was thinking it was like all the bells and whistles so i was a little bit disappointed when i went to howard family say it was just too small like it reminded me of my high school mm -hmm. but when i went to a t like the r2 i got she was so fun like she was cool i don't remember who it was but she was so cool and like everything we did she was just making it like interactive for us because a lot of times i'm an ambassador i give to her so i know it's like we have high school groups you just kind of like hurry up and do it because they get on your nerves right. or they aggravated so she was really nice she was like involved with us then like this was a time when i think it was boosie that was real big like this time so this was in our this was in 2011 this was 2011 okay, yeah, yeah was i think about. boosie was like real big so i remember like walking around or, like we walk around our tour and i saw people like listening to boosie but they had like suits and stuff and i'm like <laughs> how do they have those suits and they listen to boosie and then they were like well, you know, like, this is an HBCU, like, we're still black people, like, this is our culture, this is our type of music that we listen to, but that doesn't mean we can't excel in our academics and handle our business. So, to me, it was, like, amazing, especially, like, coming from a predominantly white area, and then I grew up here, and they telling me, you know, these people work for Exxon, and John Deere, and Verizon, people in the White House, all these large companies that people who graduate from the school work for. And I'm like, dang, and they turn up just like me, like, they listen to ratchet music, just like me, mm -hmm. but, but it don't look like it, right? And so it was, it was a shock, but it was like a relief at the same time because, like, wow, I didn't expect this coming to a college campus. But at the same time, I was like, I feel like I could be myself here. So that is what particularly made me pick A and T. Mm -hmm. But I always knew I wanted to go to HBCU because. So wait, I don't for know. just if anyone's watching, HBCU means a historically black college. So, I mean, they, and it's, it's another um, name, it's called a PWI, and that's predominantly white institution. So there are two different types of colleges, and some of them are private, either you go to a PWI or HBCU or just a private college. So just in case anyone doesn't know, HBCU means historically black college. Go ahead. Right. But that's just what made me pick a Like, I was like, I'm going to HBCU, I didn't care where it was, but I knew that it was not going to be in Florida. Mm -hmm. As long as it wasn't in Florida, I was like, I'm going to somebody at HBCU. Mm -hmm. So when I came there, I was like, wow, like this is where I felt like, I don't know, I just felt like this is where I'm supposed to be. And the thing that like still stick in my mind today is like, we, they took us to the campus right center, which is like the gym where you work out. Mm -hmm. So it's a track around it, and the track, it lights up as you run and lets you know if somebody coming behind you. And like, I didn't know why I thought that was so fascinating. Like, I just thought that was so cool. I was coming, I was like, Ma, the track light up, we run. The track light up. And my mom was like, okay, you want me running? I'm like, no. <laughs> it was cool. So that's what made me keep anti. Mm -hmm. They fear, um, you know, people will look at them for being dumb, or maybe they feel like, people are going to judge them or something. Or even too, like I know a lot, I hear this all the time, like, oh, you acting brand new, you think, I bet you got that a lot going to college. I didn't get like, that oh, so much. Oh, you going to a you 
got you brand new, da 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 da. Like, I didn't know. hear that so much, but I know some people are like, oh, you don't talk to me no more, da da. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, okay, I didn't never, like, if I cut you off, it's snip snip. Like, you cut off, <laughs> you don't yeah. know I cut you off. Yeah. It's just, I get so consumed in my day to day stuff, like going to class, going to meetings, programs, just. I swear my day consists of class meeting programs and eating somewhere in between. So like I have to like be bored. Like I mean I literally have to be bored. Like I have to have nothing to do and even when I'm bored I have like a million things I could be doing. Right. But I have to be like bored and procrastinating and mm-hmm. just pick up my phone and be like, hey, what you doing? Right. But like if it's day to day conversation like, oh I'm liking your posts here and there on social media or something like that, I talk to people. But like your interactions do change. But a thing I learned is like it's all about balance. So you have to learn how to balance these friends, that friends, home life, school life, work life, like it's really a balancing act, but I still I still don't got a down pat. Like I really don't I gotta work on it. Cause my friends always do work on it every week. Yeah, because my friends are saying, you know, oh, you don't have time for us, or oh, you always doing this, oh, you always doing that, and then my mom and my family are, oh, you all, you run the, on the streets too much, you need to stay home sometimes, and so it's, I still don't gotta figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is something, because I was, uh, another, another thing, like all this, this um, passion for HBCUs mm-hmm. came from when I was a little girl, we called him Uncle Kenny, he's always come to talk to us, and he just happened to love Howard. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, that was a, I always heard about Howard. So I'm like, oh, what is Howard? Mm-hmm. So then the second thing for me, my mom went to um, the National Coalition of Black uh, Meeting Planners. Like she went to this whole big meeting of um, like really successful black women. Mm-hmm. And a whole bunch of them were Deltas. And guess what school they went to? Howard. Howard. So she just came home and she was like, Janessa, they were so powerful. And, you know, she became lifetime friends with them. So I just began to look into Howard and I was like, oh my God, I love HBCs. I love mm-hmm. like black colleges and I love anything, you know, that empowers black people. Mm-hmm. So how did it change you? Like, and I know that before, and obviously you guys didn't know Shira, but if you guys knew, if you guys didn't know Shira, Shira has always been super confident. And like, you've always been like pro-black and like, I'm a strong black woman, even when you were like seven. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm a strong black woman. So my thing is how did that like enhance you as a woman and then as a black woman, and then as a young black woman, going to an HBCU, mm-hmm. not only that, but it's actually one of like the top 10 in the nation. How did that, how did that make you like feel about yourself? So when I first got there, I didn't, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really know like what an HBCU was. Like, I didn't know what to expect because mm-hmm. nobody in my family went to HBCU. None of my friends like went to HBCU. So I'm coming in here, I'm like, okay, I'm about to be the first one, so I really went in there open-minded. So when I first got there, and I, I would just hear things a lot of times. I would hear people say stuff like, people would be so freely like saying stuff like, oh, white people this, white people that. And not necessarily negative right. things, but they, you would just hear them openly say like, white people, I don't know, maybe they'll say, oh, that's something that white people do. Or, you know, things like that people always say white, black. They would talk about race like so openly. Mm-hmm. So I'm not used to that because I'm like, you know, if I'm about to say something white people, I'm going to look around like. Right, because we're from a white, and you went to Dunedin, right? Right. So yeah, these are, and I went from Harvard, which are both predominantly white schools. Right. So I'm used to like look around and say, like, okay, is any white people around here? I don't want to fear the white people. Right. So okay. when I got there, I'm like, wow. So I had a white teacher my first semester. I mean, he was in his class. It was geography. He'll be there white people rape black people and turn them into slaves. Like, just straight like that. So I'm like, wow. Like, <laughs> like nobody this knows like this. Reality. Yeah, right. so I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like, I didn't know that he was like popular like that. I, didn't, I just really didn't expect it. So then to see people so freely like talk about our race was, that was one thing for me that made me feel like, okay, wow, I should never be ashamed to mm-hmm. say something about white people. I should never have to check my surroundings. Because just like I'm saying they're white, it's just true, you're white, you know? Mm-hmm. So I shouldn't have to feel afraid about that. Then what really started to make me, I guess, make me feel empowered a lot was seeing so many people succeed. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, it was just like, when you see everybody around you and you know that y'all came from the same place, like not necessarily maybe the same hometown, but you know when they grew up same like you. Struggle, you know? Right, yeah. like y'all have so much in common. And then to see them succeed, it's like, wow, like, you know, I can do it too. Mm-hmm. So then knowing the things that we as black people face and then to see us come out of institutions that everybody who worked there look like us, act like mm-hmm. us, come from like us, from the people who clean to the teachers to everybody, the valedictorian, black. So every every form of excellence that there can be, 
they're at an age of exactly. Right. So yes. they're like the epitome of her person in California. Last month I went to the Clinton Global. She tried this too, by the way. She, <laughs> she tried to act all humble, but she knew a lot. We're going to get there. Sometimes. But I went to the Clinton Global <laughs> Initiative at UC Berkeley. And there was a guy. What was the name of the, the program? Clinton Global Initiative. Okay. So it's called CGRU. So I went there and there was a guy talking. And I, he was speaking to us on a panel about just basically unity. And he was black. And the other person that was on the panel was a dude. He was Native American because they face a lot of the same problems, even more than we face as black people. Native Americans do. And then the other lady, she was black. She uh, works for Teach for America. She's over the Midwest region. So she's like their executive director for the Midwest region. But what he said was that a lot of times we go off to these schools, these HBCUs, or these prestigious schools, and we get all these accolades, and we get all this experience and education and stuff, and then we take our talents to another city. And then we, and then we drive, you know, but right. we, never, we never think about going back to our city right. and, you know, bringing that same thing back to our city. But it's understandable that, you know, from, like, when I, when I come home, it's like bittersweet. It's like comfort because you know what's here, you know your family, your friends, everybody. Yeah. But then it's like I don't, I feel so uninspired. And when I look around, like I can't, I don't find people doing what I'm doing. So like at school, I, I could just look out my window and I'll see people walking in the class with books, or I see somebody holding a meeting, or trying to get them to pass like um, bills or something like that. Like it's always somebody doing something. So I can understand when he was saying that. You know, we get all these talents and things, and we don't take them back home. But I think what, the, what it challenged me also because he was saying, you know, challenge yourself to do something back for your community. Because a lot of times you do people, especially go to college, you do community service. Mm -hmm. But that's not your community. You know, that's somebody else's community. But take your talents and what you do and bring it back to your community. And I think that's what we miss because pretty much. I feel like everybody who graduated before us and people who are, like, were our age, they go off to school or some people don't go off to school. Maybe some people go to like NFL or something like that mm -hmm. and then they never come at home. Or if they come at home, it's because something fell through or they got injured. But you know what? Something that like that. is so true because I'm thinking of two or three people, not having to say their names, but uh -huh. they went and they came back and mm -hmm. now they're, they're just working. They're not mm -hmm. even doing anything. Uh, toward the community and they went to HBCUs. Mm -hmm. you know and some people I think they feel embarrassed. I think especially people, I would say more so people who go just for academics, not people who go for sports. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times they feel embarrassed coming back home because I think they feel people have so much expectations for them right. and they're coming back and they feel like a letdown. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like you still have, what what they can do is help other people see and instead of other people, you still have something to offer mm -hmm. to your community because mm -hmm. you've experienced something that they can't, so you can bring that experience back here. But it's something that I feel like it has to be, I don't think it's something that can just be taught. It's a, it's, a, it's a feeling. You have to feel like you owe it to your community. And I think a lot of people feel like, because our area was not the most served community in the city of Clearwater. So I think a lot of people feel like, you know, our community was underserved. So what am I going to give back to them for? You know, they didn't really do that for me, anything like that. And especially how things like people have hard feelings towards, like, police and things like that so they don't want to come back home. home police brutality yeah right and then you know this is just i'm gonna share this um with you and you know the watchers but i was um i think i was walking and i was still living in greenwood we too turn up so i was still <laughs> i was still living in greenwood and I, I think i was walking from my grandma's house over to the house i used to live in so i'm walking and i saw a sign on um the willa carson center and it said doctor hiring for a doctor mm -hmm. Dang, bro. The Willow Carson Center, and the Willow Carson Center is a free clinic in the, in the Greenwood community, in the Greenwood area, and it's totally free, and they offer um, pills, they offer, because like, mm -hmm. it's like, we don't even have a doctor mm -hmm. and down the street that can give people free medicine. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's what makes me applaud you, because you're going to school, you're getting your education, and then when you come back home, you help, you do what you gotta do, mm -hmm. and then you go back. And I'm pretty sure, with all the, the, the wealth that you're gaining, and all the knowledge that you're gaining, that you're gonna one day come back, hopefully, <laughs> and do stuff in the community, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you're gonna be a doctor, yeah. oh, but just, you know what I'm saying? Just that instant, that just was like, dang man. Like, I could be I could be that person, but I'm not, at the time I was in the school. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm like. Dang it, the dope boy who, who just sold, you know, 300,000 crack, he could have been that doctor, but he over there selling crack. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I agree with you, and it really does take 
like you said, it's not really something that you can just do. It's really something who you have to become. Mm-hmm. You have to become excellently, excellently black. You have mm-hmm. to become like this person who's aiming toward being excellent. Yeah, it's like our culture. Okay. It is. It's it a is. culture and it's a lifestyle. Like mm-hmm. it's at our school, you know, we say like, our things Aggie Pride, but we say Ag- that's what Aggies do. So if somebody's mm-hmm. doing something, they'll say, um, like maybe we're doing. I don't know, we're reading it to third grade because that's what Aggies do. Mm-hmm. So it's like we we're always doing something. I don't know what it is, but the Aggies are doing something. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a culture that they that they've ingrained in us that you know you always give back. Like all of them now, they come to our school, they give back. They this we have this one guy. He works for PNG, mm-hmm. and he came and PNG is one of the leading like retail companies in the world. Mm-hmm. He came to our school and basically he hired this test. You got to take two tests. Mm-hmm. One is like this weird test, all these shapes and stuff like that. And the next one is like a questionnaire. Mm-hmm. And so most people don't pass it. They just mm-hmm. fail. And they you don't even make it to get in there purely for them to even pick you for an interview if you don't make it past this test. So like he came back and did a two-day session and taught us how to pass the test. I mean, he did slideshows, practice drills, all these mock, mock interviews, everything. And but he, he went to... Yeah, he went to a and So wow. he came back and showed us like, you. yeah, <laughs> this is how you get in. Like, you know, I'm giving y'all the key. So major key. So major key. You got to give other people the key. Mm-hmm. And I think what's hard is I think a lot of people around here are uninspired. Mm-hmm. And I think you have to see... That it's that things that you that you want to do are attainable, but I think it's hard to see that some things are attainable when you don't see anybody obtaining these things. So how can you or when, your, that? when your mom is sick mm-hmm. or when your rent is paid and you ain't working enough hours or mm-hmm. when you don't have enough money like you were, you didn't have enough money to go to school at the time. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's all these things being thrown at you. So what is the advice that you could give to generation that's coming up behind us? Maybe they're looking at you and they're like, you know what, I don't, maybe I don't want to go to Aggie, or maybe I don't want to go to a and but I want to go to Howard. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I don't want to go to Howard, but I want to go to Lincoln, or I want to go to FAM, you know, I want to go to Alabama A&M, you know, so what is some advice that you could give to um, our, our, our color, mm-hmm. kids coming up that may be facing a hard time and they may just, you know, be not really seeing their way out of mm-hmm. their situation? I would say, first of all, I would say, you have to, what's the word I'm looking for? You know how some people that was talking about they circle, and when they want to go, circle so small, it's a period, all that. Okay, <laughs> so, you know, they be trying to throw Yeah. Like, you have to create a circle of supportive people around you. So, you can't expect people, like some people always say, you know, oh, people not loyal, I don't have any friends and all that. You don't have that many friends, where do you think you're going to get in life? Like, you you are never, you're never on a journey alone. No matter how alone that you feel that you are, you're still not alone. And you, successful people always have a support system. Even if your support system is your husband and your sister, that's a support system. So you have to create a support system for yourself. And what you have to do is seek out people who are like-minded. So if you know that, if everybody hang out with all y'all do is smoke and party, every time you link up with your friends, the only thing y'all do is smoke, party, eat crowd trays, go to the beach, <laughs> you're going to have to boss up. Right. So if you're seeking out individuals that are like-minded and you know, okay, one day, um, I don't know, one day I want to be an anesthesiologist. So anesthesiologists not going to be smoking, drinking, and crowd trades on the beach. Every weekend. So you're going to need to go find people who are doing that. Maybe you start volunteering at the hospital. Or maybe you, um, I don't know, maybe you meet people, you sign up for school. You meet people in the class. But you have to go seek out people that are, are like you. That's the first thing you got to do. So you got to create a support system. Then the next thing is you have to be open-minded. So when I came to ANT, I, like I said, I didn't know what to expect, right? But I knew when I got in my uh, suite, I had a suite. So there's four rooms and there's two people each room. So there's eight people in my suite. So I had a suite. And in my suite, one, two, three, four of us were transfer students. So there was one girl, this white girl named Angel. She's older than me. Angel's like 22, 23, okay? Then it was my friend Mackenzie and my friend Shakira. Shakira and Mackenzie only did one year at um, the university back home and transferred to the But pretty much, we didn't really talk Angel like that, so I'm just saying I was the oldest person mm-hmm. out of everybody else. So to me, I'm like, I was against meeting them or anything, but I was like, I don't know if, you know, if we're going to have that much in common because I'm much older than them and I've already been in school for two years and I have a job. And that's that's right, so I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have, yeah, so I don't know if I'm going to have anything in common with them. 
So I was just like, I'm gonna give it a chance. Like, I mean, I live with them, so I might as well. So I was surprised to find out, like, you you'll be surprised who you can learn things from. Like you, and it might not be like learning things like um, you know, like they'll teach you chemistry, but it may be you learn something like my friend Shakira, like she life of the party. Anytime you go somewhere, she, it don't matter what you're doing, she will turn up. Like you could be at church and you ain't playing a tambourine and she'll be at the middle of Like it's like Shakira turned out, but like she never turned out. So I learned to like see different qualities in people that I like don't have in myself. But that's why I like hanging out with them because I see things in them that I wish that I had. And like my friend Mackenzie, she is so nice, you know, she she like you. Like she won't try to cuss you out or nothing. She'll be really nice to you and let you just do that. Don't cross the line. Right. But see I'm not like that. Like you got like one time and after that one time <laughs> it's over with for you. So it's things like that. So you create a support system, you find people that are like you. And then the the hardest thing is you have to like go through the struggle. Like it's really a struggle out here. Like black college students are the most impoverished group in the United States. Meaning as first generation college students, you go into college and you're back home, a lot of times your parents can't send you money. And it's not because they don't want to send you money, but they, have they don't have money to send you, like free money. Like every bit of money they have goes to a bill or something. So it's times where like I already know I can't even call at home and ask for money because I already know like my mom don't have the money. So I'm not going to be stressing her about, oh, can I get some money? But it's like, it's a struggle out here because you have to go, sometimes you got to go without something. It might, might be going without sleep, you might be going without food, you might not even have your own room, you might be sleeping on somebody's couch. But you have to be willing to put in that struggle and sacrifice. You have to be willing to sacrifice something to get where you want to go. Because if you don't sacrifice, nothing like how much do you really love what you're trying to do like if if you're not willing to sacrifice something what are you willing to gain like mm -hmm. i can't say that you want to gain something sometimes it's hard and you might get frustrated or you get over like a lot of times you hear people say like oh i'm so over school or whatever like i'm over school this is my fifth year in school like i should have been have my degree by now but i'm not gonna be like oh i'm done i'm quitting this or whatever no i get up every single day and i go to class i still make a's and b's because i know i don't have a choice mm -hmm. like it's time i have to walk to the library which is a whole mile from a residence hall in the rain just to print a piece of paper and then you gotta sit there for two hours for the rain to stop so your piece of paper won't get wet when you go turn it into teacher. Mm -hmm. It's like things like that wow. where it's frustrating but <laughs> what are you what are you gonna do? Right. And like I think when I think about, you know, when you struggles like that, some people they always say like, oh you know, grind now, shine later. But y'all yeah, not really about that. Like when it's when people say grind, like you really be out here grinding. Like there's I remember when I went to Orlando, when I went to Orlando, when me and my friends first got out there, none of us had a car. We didn't have a job, nothing. Like I put this on every day. This is why I rock with them to this day so hard. Mm -hmm. We would cook ramen noodles in a pot, okay? <laughs> everybody would eat out the pot. Cause it wasn't no bowl. We didn't have a bowl, so everybody eat out the pot. Like we would drink Kool-Aid out measuring cups. Cause we didn't have no cups. Or like That's what I'm talking about. refill right, right, Arizona right, yeah. teacups. Like anything like that, we would like I mean, we was out there just we just knew we had to get up from home so we could do something with our life. But we were like making the most out of the situation. But as some people could look at it like, oh no, I wouldn't have did that. Like, I would just stay home where I know I got a roof on my head, this that third. But it's like I went to that to get to where I am. So look at where I'm at now. But and I'm not even really I ain't even did nothing yet. Don't like, even No. What? The struggle, I'm still in the struggle. You know what I mean? But the morning is not always the morning. The morning might be maybe a little bit two, three years down the road. Right. You might not see the sunshine, but you have to keep that in mind that like you have an ultimate goal. So yeah, just create the circle of people mm -hmm. and I forget what else it was. But you gotta create you gotta create a support system. You gotta be willing to go through the struggle. Sacrifice. And if you if you put if you do that, you're not gonna fail. Mm -hmm. You because you don't give yourself the option. Wow.